One of the things that comes up if you Google Bible verses about integrity is this one that's printed in the bulletin from the book of Proverbs, which just kind of caught my attention. Those who walk in integrity walk securely, but those who make their ways crooked will be found out. Do you think you would have, you, she probably would have been found out eventually. Yeah. And I was just kind of captivated by that wood, word crooked, and I'm not sure whether I should be or not, and that's what I chose to title the sermon. Um, and we are talking about integrity, and crooked seems like an interesting kind of contrast to integrity, and I'm sure you all remember those of you who were alive at the time, 1973, Richard Nixon saying, what did he say? I am not a crook. He probably was, but <laughs> that was what he said. And you know, it's kind of a, it feels to me like kind of a retro word. I'm not sure that we use the word crook very much to describe people who have broken the law or done something else that we don't really like, but still I'm kind of captivated by that word. I just want to make it clear we're not talking about physical disabilities in any sort of way, and we contrast the idea of the crooked path to the straight path, and I'm not sure that any paths are really straight. So I'm not sure about that as a metaphor, but anyway, I was just captivated by that word, crooked. Crook. It's one of those words that you can say with kind of a self-righteous sneer. It's a crook. I have been thinking about this idea of whether integrity is a biblical value or not. If you, like I said, if you look it up, it doesn't really appear a whole lot in the Bible as a specific word. It's not spoken of quite as straightforwardly as some other biblical values about love and justice and mercy and loving kindness and some things like that. It's not like this verse about integrity, that verse about integrity. But it feels to me like it is such an important concept in the faith life. And I've come to think of it as kind of a, a biblical theological cocktail. It's like you mix a few things together that clearly are biblical values, and what you come up with really is the idea of integrity. So, for example, if you take the idea of truth, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free and in that biblical verse, it's not really talking about telling the truth exactly. It's, I think it's more about understanding a bigger truth. And when you know that truth, you will be set, three, set free. But we know that truth is important. And we know that there's something about being called to account that is part of our religious tradition. And that implies somehow that what we're doing or who we are or how that's being manifest in the world at any particular point isn't quite in line with where it should be, whether that's for our own good or for the larger good. So it seems to me that Jesus was very much about going about in the world and kind of calling people out, kind of saying to them, eh, do, you, do you see? Do you see how what you're doing or what you are isn't really serving you very well? Or it's not serving the common good, that interaction with the woman at the well, where he just kind of calmly said, well, you know, you've had a lot of men in your life, haven't you? But still there is this living water that is for you. And he has this interchange with Zacchaeus, who comes down from the tree and has dinner with him. And in the process of responding to Jesus' word, Zacchaeus changes his life. He makes good on some of the evil that he's done in the past. And Jesus went around to the shorelines and he grabbed fisher people. He said, there might be something bigger in your life than just fishing. So there's something about that kind of calling to account getting things lined up, the internal and the external, or the individual and the communal. And then there's just this whole idea of confession, that we might be self-reflective, that we might look at our own behavior, our own actions, and recognize where we've come up short and admit that, and to know that gap between what we're doing and perhaps what we should be doing, again, perhaps for our own good 
perhaps for that larger connection. So if you take these things and you put them together with the idea that there is a higher power, there is a greater law, there is a different set of values by which we might live in the world, I think by mixing those things up in that biblical theological cocktail, you end up with integrity. That thing of having things lined up, the internal, the external, that word implies not just an internal experience, but it kind of implies action. How am I behaving in the world? Am I doing the right thing? And of course, as soon as we ask that question, we have this question, well, what is right? And that's why it's important to recognize that we have this larger set of ideas and values that might guide who we are and what we do in the world. Now, the reason I think this is particularly important at this point in time is because so many of the systems in our world are functioning by different sets of rules. They are not being controlled by some rules that might include some of these values. There are institutions that are running exactly as they are meant to do given the way the system is set up, but it lacks integrity. Do you realize that that can be true? Corporations, most corporations, are behaving just as they are supposed to in the context of capitalism. They are doing exactly what they're doing, and not only are they doing exactly what they're doing, but they are also controlled by some ethical rules that suggest that it is also an ethical system. Without some sort of overarching value system that might suggest that there's some values that actually supersede those, there are institutions and forms and organizations that are behaving exactly as they should, but they are not necessarily doing the right thing. Now, there's a difference, I think, between working in a system unethically and a system that may, in fact, be in many ways unethical or lack integrity. So, for example, a politician who takes a bribe that clearly lacks integrity, and it's an individual action contrary to the laws in which that system works, but what if the system is set up in a way that is essentially lacking integrity? What is it if anyone can contribute any amount of money you might want to the political process and expect some sort of return, whether it's access or action or legislation or whatever? That's the system that we have found ourselves in. In my opinion, that lacks integrity. And if you look around in the world, it seems to me, and it may just be me, but I look around in the world and I see a lack of integrity in, in our government systems. I see a lack of integrity in, in our marketplace. I see a lack of integrity in the ways that we communicate the truth in the world through media. I see a lack of integrity in advertising. I see a lack of integrity all around, and sometimes it's because of the way the system is set up, and sometimes it is because there are actors in the world who lack integrity. Now, it seems to me that part of our job as Christians in this place, in this time, is to suggest that there is a higher order, that it is not just enough for everyone to have as much freedom of speech as they might think they deserve, whether that's words or influence or money buying influence. That we might suggest as Christians that actually that subverts the common good, 
which is one of our values. We might, as Christians, say, well, you know, it is possible to tell the truth, but not be telling the whole truth. And we have this cousin idea here of being disingenuous, which is kind of like when you say something that really is true, but it really doesn't acknowledge the whole truth. Watch politicians. That's what spin is about. In a sense, they're telling the truth. They're naming part of the truth, but it is not the whole truth. It is not nothing but the truth. And in my opinion, that lacks integrity. Coming out of a conversation I had with a a member of this congregation, I, I realized that We don't do outrage very well. We are not the outrageous people, now are we? If I stood up here and I really embodied the kind of outrage I feel at that, I would be completely over the top for our people. And that thing I did just now, that was like a four (laughs) out of maybe ten. We don't do that, but how can we sit here and not be outraged? How can we not be outraged at the way politics are working right now? The lack of action, the the ways that political influence or that, that political gain is the primary goal. It's not about getting anything done. It is about finding the ways to stay in power for whatever reason. The the current immigration crisis. We have people coming over our borders who are, who are starving, who are in trouble. We actually need these people to help our economy run, and yet we act like they're not welcome. That is outrageous. So, you know, as people who don't do outrage, What are we going to do? (laughs) Perhaps we start where we have the most efficacy, the most agency, and that is in, in all our settings. What does it mean to stand up, to be in our integrity? And you know, the challenge of integrity is that in anything that has to do with honesty or, or looking at the, at the, at the crooked in, as opposed to anything else, is that one act, however small, where we move out of an integrity, takes like seven or eight acts in the other direction to balance it out. Once you've done that one thing, it's like people aren't really sure until they see a consistent path of action. So what does it mean for us to live in integrity in our own lives, to demonstrate that to our children, to our co-workers, to our colleagues, to our family, to our friends, to rest in that? You, you are people of integrity. You are people of integrity. You may not be the people of the outrage, but you are the people of integrity. And this is one of the things that I've been so impressed with in my life in the United Church of Christ is to see people standing in their integrity. And oftentimes when you stand in your integrity, you have to let go of self-interest. You might have to do something that was actually contrary to your self-interest or at least outside of your self-interest. And sometimes that's the sign of integrity, isn't it? When you see someone acting in a way that seems contrary, or it seems like, oh, they have something to lose in that process. In the mid-80s, some of my gay and lesbian friends who really wanted to be ministers, they wanted to be ministers really badly in the United Church of Christ. And I watched them as they made these courageous choices about being out in the search process. This is a question that is still going on in the LGBT community. When in the search process do I come out? And here were people who were saying, you know, 
If I'm going to be in integrity, I have to be up front right at the beginning. And I was so impressed. Some of you know Wendy Taylor. She was working for Puente, um, and this church has had some interactions with that group. I was like, the integrity coming off of Wendy Taylor when she made that, that kind of decision in her own life, it was amazing. Jim Lauer, many of you know Jim Lauer, he did the same thing. And you know they lost those jobs. They did not get called, even though there were people in those congregations who were voting for them, like 60 or 70 percent of the people, it wasn't quite enough. A lot of people were willing to stand in their integrity. They were willing to honor the integrity of these people. And yet, it was a risk for them, and there was a loss because of it. I mean, choosing to act when you might have something to lose is an interesting faith challenge. It's an interesting faith challenge. And are we ready to do that? I would hope. I would hope. And I think so. I think it is time. I think it is time for us as a community, as a, as a culture, to call for integrity in, in, our, in our lives, in all parts of our lives, the local and the, the regional and the national and even international, for us to stand. Stand up. Do the right thing. And demand that others do that too. We can do this. We are perfectly capable. And God is calling us to this, in my humble opinion. And God is calling us to this, I believe, in this specific time. This meal that's set up behind us is, is the integrity dinner. It's where we say, yes, God, I need a part of you. Yes, God, I need to be with others as I do this. Yes, God, even this small amount can feed me. Yes, God, I need to do this over and over and over again because I'm about to slip off the path. This is a meal of, intensity that, of, of integrity that we can all take together may not be an easy thing, and we can support each other in this process, and we can even kind of call each other out just very gently. We don't want to get too excited. But we can do this. We can do this together. I'm pretty sure. Amen.